Welcome to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio with author, speaker, and your host, Pat Rulo, serving you a generous helping of everything you need to know to help you and your loved ones stay safe during any doctor or hospital visit. The program is not intended to replace medical advice from a licensed professional, but rather to encourage you to become a well-informed participant in your health and well-being. And now, your host, Pat Rulo. Hello, I'm Pat Rulo. Thanks for joining me again. I'm always happy that you're here, even though I can't see you. But I do know you're listening because of the amount of phone calls and emails I receive. Now, I want you to know that I try to return all phone calls, but often folks leave me messages with no phone numbers, or when I do try to call back, there is no voicemail capability. And due to the large volume of callbacks, after a few tries, I just run out of time. Another situation with the phone is that I keep my cell phone turned off and only check it once each day. And the reason is, I don't believe in safe phone. Knowing what I know about how cell phones radiate microwave frequencies and cause DNA breaks and eventual ill health, I choose not to use a cell phone at all. I don't text. I don't call. I simply use the safer alternative, a landline. Now you might say, how can anyone in today's world do business without a cell phone? Voila, it can be done and quite easily. I do it. Yes, you can be a successful person without constantly gazing, checking and rechecking a cell phone. So if you can, the best way to reach me is via email. And I absolutely return every single email personally. My email address is pat at speakupandstayalive.com. That's pat at speakupandstayalive.com. And just to let you know that my internet connection is not wireless. It is hardwired with an ethernet cable. So I'm safe there as well. Something you should take into consideration. Well, now that's not to say that you cannot leave me a phone message. Please do. I will call you back, but please leave a callback number and I will make several attempts to reach you. Now, just for a moment, with cell phones in mind, I want you to hear something. I have a meter that detects radiation frequencies given off by wireless technology, cell phones, Wi-Fi, smart meters. And since this is radio, I cannot show you what the meter looks like or what it does, but it has audio that also indicates the level of radiation. So not only does the meter light up with colors corresponding to the level of radiation, green for somewhat safe, yellow for unsafe, and red for severe danger, but you could also hear the levels. I have the meter right here and it's turned off. I also have a cell phone sitting next to the meter and it too is turned off. Now I'm turning the meter on in a room that has no radiation. Listen to how the meter sounds. Just a soft hum. In fact, you probably can't hear anything. Okay, now I'm turning on the cell phone. You'll hear the traditional cell phone tune as it powers up. And then as the phone makes the connection to the cell tower, listen to what the meter does. Now, when you heard the loud screeching sound, the lights flashed red all the way up to the top of the most highest severe reading on the meter. This is what happens when you use a cell phone. Every time you dial, connect, download, talk, listen, disconnect, these huge pulsing ragged frequencies are blasting through your body, through your brain. 
damaging the blood-brain barrier. A body that was never designed to withstand this kind of constant barrage of discord and harm. Can you imagine if you had to hear those sounds all day long, all night long, week after week, month after month for years? You'd go insane. Your body would shut down. Your nervous system would cease. Well, what you heard is what I imagine your body is feeling as it is bathed in these constant high levels of unnatural radio frequencies. This is why I do not use a cell phone and why I encourage you to consider how often you use yours. Here's the question you might ask. Is this conversation that I'm having with the person on the other end worth my health? Is it worth the harm? Are we discussing the final touches on the cure for cancer? Or is the conversation, he said what? I'm turning left now. What are you wearing tonight? Hi, I'm bored. Well, now to stay on the same track, I received an email a few days ago, one of hundreds, but I thought that this was quite shocking and important enough to share with you. It's about smart meters, the electric, gas, or water meter that the utility company has most likely already slapped onto your home without your knowledge or informed consent. And so with that, let's head into today's healthcare hazard of the week. The smart meter is a surveillance device that monitors your energy consumption behavior and it emits biologically destructive pulsed and dirty electricity radiation in your home, such as we just heard. And it is unlawful, it's illegal because your power company has no easement, has no rightful access to do that. Now, if you don't know if you have a smart meter or not, after the show, go outside and look. If your electric meter still has the spinning dials, then it's a safe analog meter. A smart meter looks a lot like the electric meters we've been used to for years, but the numbers on the smart meter are displayed digitally. There are also dangerous gas meters and water meters, so check all of your meters to be sure. So let me read this letter. Pat, my electric company finally replaced my smart meter with an analog meter today. I only get to try it for five days and see if I'm better. So apparently they put in a smart meter, she complained, and they put in supposedly an analog meter to give her a trial. She goes on to say, they replaced it after continually telling me that they could not do it because other people would also want it, and also saying that dirty electricity was some hype for people to make money, and refusing to give me the date when it was changed to see if it coincides with when I started feeling sick. I was told that they replaced so many at once and they don't know the month or the year and telling me that they would have to bring it up in front of their board despite my health issues. My problem, they finally replaced it today and some of my symptoms are worse. I usually have tingling, burning scalp, heart palpitations, tingling in my cheek. Now I feel like pins are pricking on my arms and legs and the bottom of my feet. My lip feels like a pin is pricking the corner. My chest feels hot, like I have mentholatum on it and like it's going to explode. So my question is, is there a way they could have changed the voltage or put on a fake analog meter? I hope this doesn't sound crazy, but why would my symptoms be worse than ever? I did have them sign that this was a non-electronic electromagnetical analog meter. I also measure with my Graham Stetzer meter before and after they replaced it, and all the readings went up by 100 after they changed it to the analog. Any help would be appreciated. Now how despicable, this is me, now how despicable is this? Does anyone really think that for one nanosecond that the utility company does not have the exact day and time recorded and on file when the smart meter was installed? And to say, if you get one, then everyone will want one? Or to allow her five days to see if she's feeling better? Really? What world are we in? Why is the utility company suddenly in charge of us? Well, I responded by sending her to a website of a gentleman whom I interviewed a while back, Jerry Day. 
You may remember that segment on Smart Meters where he talked about taking things into our own hands and purchasing your own analog meter and having a qualified electrician install it. So when you have a chance, I'd like you to go to his website. It is called freedomtaker.com, freedomtaker.com. He also talks about fake analog meters being installed. So no, her question is not out of the realm of possibility. So go to freedomtaker.com and download the free forms to send to your power company. This notice gives them a limited time to install a safe analog meter. And if they don't, it secures your right to replace the meter yourself. Yes, you can replace it yourself with a safe electric meter that you could purchase from the website freedomtaker.com. It's $69.95 plus tax and $15 for shipping. And it ships within two business days. And let me share a disclaimer here. I, nor this radio station, nor anyone else connected to me receive any money from this. I'm just passing the information along to you. So I'm not guaranteeing anything, just sharing. The freedomtaker.com website assures us that the replacement meter that you purchase does not radiate your home with dirty electricity or pulsed data transmissions, that it does not monitor your personal activities, that it does not share your personal living habits with the world, and it does not create dirty electricity like the smart meter that the utility company deploys. So that was my letter to her. And then later that day, I received this response. And I think it's worth sharing because thousands of people are experiencing the same reactions and maybe have not connected the dots or figured out how to equate their symptoms with the installation of a smart meter. Pat, thank you for replying so quickly. I couldn't believe how my symptoms went totally off the grid last night. I have never felt like pins were poking my feet, legs, and arms, and I have a terrible headache. I was desperately searching the internet for some help at 3.30 in the morning. I live in blank, blank city, and I'm not going to name the city or state. I was also wondering if they could change the voltage on the analog. I've been talking with the electric company for the last year and a half. I had not been able to have a good night's rest in all that time. All the sensitivity started with switching to a smartphone in August of 2010 and getting blisters on my head within three months, followed by hair loss, eight doctors, three blood tests, and a scalp biopsy. Last May, they did put the analog meter back on after months talking back and forth, but by then I had already made arrangements to get out of the house for a few months, and they put it back on while I was gone and said, we would talk about it when I got home. It has been a polite song and dance back and forth. I've had enough facts from the notes I've taken from the internet that gave me more information to contradict what they were telling me. I know from our polite conversations that hell will freeze over before they let me keep the analog meter. As I said before, they told me that if they let me have an analog, then everyone who feels sick will want one. I said, you mean to tell me that even though you know how sick I am, you won't give me back my analog because it might hurt your business? Is that how you care for your customers? I told them I did not ask for this health problem. Well, this was followed by more song and dance, but I heard what they said. They are aware of how EMF sensitive I am. We removed our wireless last March. I retired from teaching in May because the school put wireless in our building. I can't use a cell phone, so we are back to a landline. We have tried lots of things, including going out on the patio and turning off the main breaker to the house before we go to sleep. They are also aware that two weeks ago, I was walking one block from my house and I got hit. The term I like to use to represent this unforeseen force, I got hit on the upper right corner of my head that went through to the back of my right eye, and my vision went black in both eyes for a couple of seconds. I'm stubborn, so I continued on my three-mile walk. I got seven more light hits, which stopped after the electric line stopped. There have been a few conversations where they stumbled over the subject of making sure they were protected, I guess from being held accountable for any of my health problems. Anyway, sorry to give you so much background information, but I wanted you to understand my health predicament. Okay, I guess what I need to do is get a meter as soon as possible. Can you tell me what meter you suggest? I realize that I must purchase different meters to read different things. 
Thank you again for replying to a stranger looking desperately for answers. That makes the world a better place to live. So, this is me. Now we have this poor woman arguing with who? Installers? Phone receptionists? People who perhaps worked at McDonald's last month and now answer phones? Well, these people don't know anything. They only know what they're told to say. The installers are not certified electricians, and hundreds of smart meters have been catching on fire. So a conversation with these people is a waste of time. And she's seen doctors. Doctors either don't know about EMF symptoms, don't understand electromagnetic hypersensitivity, they don't have the training, or they don't want to admit it for fear of industry or employer retribution. But if you take the time to study this issue, you will conclude that it is real. People are getting sick. Our bodies are not meant to withstand the pulsing, jagged frequencies emitted by smart meters, cell towers, cell phones, Wi-Fi. But no, in the name of big telecom, big utility, big, bigger, and more, we the people are left to suffer the consequences. Of what? A grand experiment? Ruthless and cold-blooded murder? Attached to our homes, no less? And who will pay for this health crisis in the end? All we can do right now is arm ourselves with information, with facts from reputable and honest people, not installers, not the phone gals or the public utility commission who is sitting back counting your dollars, but from places like this program, our website, and really so many other resources out there attempting to share the truth. Now, besides information, you'll also need an EMF meter, a measuring device to detect and show you what's really going on in your home. These frequencies are not visible. They don't smell. And unless you are somewhat sensitive, you don't immediately feel them. And I say immediately because given enough time and enough exposure from multiple sources, your cell phone, the cell tower down the street, the Wi-Fi in your building, in restaurants, libraries, banks, Eventually, you will feel it and see it as it manifests in symptoms, cancer, sterility, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, heart attacks, stroke. These frequencies affect your body immediately, even though you don't feel it. Damage is being done every time our body is hit with these microwave frequencies. So if you want to purchase a detection meter, which I highly recommend, we are working diligently to get them on our website. So check the shop page at speakupandstayalive.com. And we are uh, not making any money on these. This is just a place where I can forward you to another venue. So check the speakupandstayalive.com website. Check the shop page. And finally, if you do not want to buy a meter and you live in the Cleveland area, I will be happy to come to your home, office, or wherever with the folks from Healthy Home to check your space with three different meters and give you a complete analysis and suggestions of what you can do to improve the quality of your environment. We are not building environmentalists, nor do we charge like they might, but we can give you a quick summation, give you the visuals you need to understand the problem and how to begin to make positive changes. Letters like the one I shared today make me sick. Never would I have dreamed that we, the people, would have to fight for our health, our privacy, our freedom, and ultimately our lives at the hands of greed and disregard for human life. What can we do? Speak up. Speak up, loud and fast. Share this with everyone you know, everyone you meet. There's no time for polite conversations with people who have no idea what they're talking about. Robot utility employees who do what they're told, regurgitate what they're taught. No time for this. The time to take action is now. Send those certified, I'm putting you on legal notice letters to your utility company, the Public Utility Commission. Write, call, sit on your legislator's front doorsteps until something is done. You don't have to be slowly cooked in your home by smart meters while governments, globalists, and bureaucracies line their pockets while ruthlessly disregarding life and humanity. Go to our website, speakupandstayalive.com, and visit the Stop Smart Meter page. There are resources for you to learn about the problem and offer solutions. 
And if you really want to delve into this topic, visit BoilTheFrogRadio.com. That's BoilTheFrogRadio.com. I and my co-host Sebastian have interviewed some of the world's top scientists and researchers on political health hazards. And I said political, especially with regard to these devastating microwave frequencies, chemtrails, and much more. I implore you to pay attention, to learn, read, ask, think, and finally, take action. Am I going off the deep end? I don't think so. It is never right to take the freedom and health away from another, but it sure is right to fight for your own. I say it all the time, and that's why this is the name of this program. You have to speak up and stay alive. In your face, all over the place. We're online 24 7. 24 7. You're listening to the hottest. SpeakUpAndStayAlive.com. That's SpeakUpAndStayAlive.com. Well, you are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio, and I am your hostess, Pat Rulo, with a topic and a guest that, believe it or not, is a first on our program. Most of the time, we talk about health care and hospital hazards from the patient, family member, doctor, or nurse perspective. But what about the first responders, the emergency medical service people, the 911 folks? Well, today I have quite the expert with us. He is Mike Tegman. Mike has spent the last 40 years in emergency medical services. He started as a volunteer in Castle Rock, Colorado, and has worked as an EMT, a paramedic, flight medic, field training officer, quality improvement manager, and general manager in 911 EMS systems across the United States. He is an associate professor for the graduate program in emergency health services management at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. For 12 years, he did full-time consulting, working with EMS systems in 48 of the U.S. states, most of the Canadian provinces, Europe, Israel, Palestine, Australia, and Tasmania. Mike has published over 500 articles and spoken at hundreds of conferences on topics ranging from change management and street survival to electrocardiography and the disease of alcoholism. He has a master's in organizational systems from Saybrook University and is a certified improvement advisor with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Can we ask for anything more? Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you very much, Pat. Oh, such a thrill to have you here today. Well, we talk quite a bit about cross-contamination on this program, and on occasion, I've spoken about the ambulance ride, guessing that this might be a place that is hard to clean and might harbor infection-causing germs and bacteria. Is that true, or what other places or times during an emergency encounter is cross-contamination a concern? Uh, certainly, like any healthcare setting, ambulances um, and the equipment that are used by paramedics, either from uh, fire department or ambulance services, have the potential to contain viruses or bacteria from other patients that have been cared for if they're not properly cleaned. So the ambulance ride is the beginning, and then once we get into the emergency room, is, is there concern there as well? Uh, absolutely. All right. Well, what can the everyday person do then to prepare themselves and even perhaps prepare their home for a potential emergency visit, say a 911 call? So I guess what I'm, I'm looking for is if the person is alone and unconscious, how can you accurately diagnose and treat them without knowing their history or medications or even their end of life or resuscitation preferences? Uh, certainly it is, uh, it is challenging when uh, patients are unable to communicate. Um, then you have to rely on basic signs and symptoms and the things that we uh, find in their home. You'll look around to see if there are medications or if there is uh, one of the vial of life attached to their refrigerator or in their, uh, in their freezer um, that may give you some medication information, some past medical history information. Um, one of the challenges is that, the, is that those are notoriously uh, difficult to keep up. Uh, people will get those and put down their whole list of medications and put it in the refrigerator 
and then uh, change physicians and have different diagnoses and come off medications and go on new medications and forget to update their list. It certainly is helpful uh, to have that information. It's not essential because you can pretty much figure out the basics of uh, vital emergency medical care um, without that information. Uh, the one exception being um, uh, do not resuscitate or end of life uh, kind of requests and orders. Um, if those aren't available, uh, the presumption by the paramedics is that uh, a person wants to live uh, until proven otherwise. Interesting. So let's say you have a person that already is compromised. They have a compromised health situation and they know that they're fragile. Say it might be an older person. It might be helpful then if they just did have a list of their allergies and, and maybe their advanced directives somewhere. Is there a, a singular place that that should be where the emergency response folks know where to look? You know, the, the vial of life, historically, you put a, a little uh, sign on the front door that there is one inside, and it uh, tends to go uh, on or in the refrigerator is the most common place for, uh, for people to have that. Um, if somebody is bed-bound and is in their bedroom, um, having their medications all in one uh, box next to their bed is a another common way to deal with things and having the paperwork included there as well. Right, right. I just think it's important to prepare, especially for folks who know that they have medical problems and may live alone, right? Absolutely. Right. It'll make Absolutely. You... And on, on the topic of preparation, one of the things I, I will put a pitch out there for is that um, I believe everybody should learn how to do compression-only CPR. Mm -hmm. I believe it is actually a life skill. It's like riding a bicycle or knowing how to swim or uh, knowing uh, which fork to use when you're... Uh, at a, a fancy restaurant, everyone should be able to know how to do compression-only CPR. And if everyone in, the, in our society and communities knew how to do that, a larger percentage of people would be uh, resuscitated and able to go home from the hospital after they suffer a cardiac arrest. Oh, excellent advice. Thank you for mentioning that. I didn't even think of that. Excellent. When I was thinking, because the EMS deal with fast-moving and many time life and death situations, how do you still manage to treat the person as a whole person? And when in such a situation, do you keep the patient engagement, patient experience in mind, or is your sole goal to keep the person alive? It's a, it's a both and. The reality is most 911 calls are, are not truly life or death situations. Mm -hmm. And most of the patients that we care for are awake and able to interact and able to participate in their health care choices. When I show up on a scene, I always start by making eye contact, introducing myself, asking the person their name, asking uh, what it is that happened that uh, caused them to reach out for help today, mm -hmm. and then really listen. You're listening for clinical diagnostic criteria about the nature of their pain or their difficulty breathing or whatever it might happen to be, but you're also listening for their uh, fears, issues related to family members, you know, many people, particularly people who live alone, worry about their pets. Mm, yes. Uh, they worry about the safety of their household and their belongings. They worry if uh, somebody's going to see them taken off to the hospital and maybe come in and, and steal some of their belongings from their house. There are a lot, of, a lot of concerns that people may have that if you kind of listen between the lines, you may be able to recognize and help address while you're addressing whatever clinical issue brought you to the scene in the first place. Wow, so not just a clinical expertise, almost a psychological and a, an emotional and empathetic type of a person as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I was wondering about dangerous patients. I'm sure you come across violent or intoxicated patients or even the people around them who might be unruly. Just how do you deal with that? Well, as you develop experience in EMS, you certainly do uh, run across situations, most often involving people who are under the, under the influence of whether it is a mind-altering substance, most commonly alcohol, to tell you the truth, or um, they may have a low blood sugar state or a low, something that has caused their oxygen level in their system to be low, all of which can make you uh, irritated, cranky, and potentially violent. Mm -hmm. So you learn how to recognize the signs that somebody might be violent, uh, you position yourself in such a way that if uh, somebody were to, to strike out, um, that you can walk and protect yourself from getting hurt. You learn how to, as part of your uh, examination, to determine if there may be a, a weapon hidden on them, and you, you learn how to remove that without them necessarily being aware of it to improve your safety. Wow. 
Well, I have a great respect for what you do because it's multifaceted. <laughs> it, it is multifaceted, and that's what keeps it engaging. Even after 40 years, <laughs> uh, the next 911 call you show up on is going to be a different person in a different house yep. with a different set of complaints than anything else you've ever dealt with before. So it's, it's always fresh and new, and if you like people and you have an innate compassion and curiosity, it's a pretty good way to make a living. Oh, I'm sure, and very rewarding. You have to think on your feet, but the outcome for people, I mean, you're, the, you're their lifeline at that point in time, so what an important person you are when you walk in. Uh, well, we, we, we feel that the patient's the most important person, <laughs> and we're there to serve them. I know, but they probably think you're the most important person. You're just like, oh my gosh, thank you for arriving, and, and you know, they look to you as the person that's going to help them. Sometimes it becomes a little mutual admiration society. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Well, now, with Ebola in the news, can we talk a little bit about EMS and the preparedness? Have you gotten any conversations or, or training on that? Uh, absolutely. EMS systems uh, throughout the world and uh, certainly throughout the United States have uh, taken a number of steps, extra steps to be prepared for Ebola. We already uh, have uh, things in place to protect ourselves and our patients from other uh, fluid-borne diseases like uh, hepatitis or HIV, those types of things, um, other fluid-borne uh, illnesses like, like C. diff mm -hmm. or, uh, or MRSA or the, the flu, um, those things are all things that we deal with on a much more frequent basis. And the uh, precautions uh, when dealing with an Ebola patient are uh, essentially the same uh, they're just heightened a little bit because of the uh, mortality rates associated with Ebola. And uh, when somebody is at the, the height of their disease process with Ebola, the virus uh, tends to be uh, available on their skin and throughout other bodily fluids. So it, uh, it is perceived to be a, more of a contagion. Very interesting times for you. Yes, they are. <laughs> I'm sure. And then I was even thinking, what about terrorism training? I know we're getting off in a crazy subject, but I would imagine that's something you have to be thinking about as well. Absolutely. There's training involved in, uh, in bioterrorism and uh, chemical terrorism, multiple shooter incidents. Every one of those things you see in the news, uh, there are EMS providers involved at some level. Right, right. All right. Well, so much to know about this topic, and we've never really gone there before, so I think you're giving us a little thumbnail sketch of, of that. Is there anything else missing that you'd like to share or anything that you do that you're really passionate about that you'd like to share with us? Uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, we certainly notice is that a number of the things that uh, cause 911 to be activated are people with uh, chronic diseases such as asthma, uh, diabetes, epilepsy, and there, there are uh, a number of things that if patients would take the time to educate themselves on uh, self-care mm -hmm. and set up systems for themselves to remind themselves to take their medication, uh, make sure they know how to use their medications properly. It's very common with uh, asthma patients to not, not understand uh, the difference between maintenance medications and, and rescue medications and how you use each type of inhaler. Um, so, uh, you know, pushing your, uh, your physician, your nurse practitioner, your PA, your uh, primary care providers to spend the time to, to teach you uh, how to effectively care for yourself, um, you're less likely to end up in a health situation that requires 911 to be called. That is excellent advice, absolutely, to be proactive and to be an empowered patient and know what it is that you need to know about your own health and, and monitor that and manage that, and it'll keep you away from you, right? Absolutely, and um, if there's, uh, there's any doubt or any concern, a um, uh, situation arises, um, we're here for you all over the country. This is great. Well, now, where can we find out more about you and what you do? Our, uh, our corporate website is uh, www.amr.net. Uh, that uh, lets you know about uh, American Medical Response. Uh, it also has links to our uh, parent company, uh, Envision Healthcare. Um, and my uh, personal website is uh, www.emsleader.com. Wow, and you are an EMS leader. What a pleasure to have you with us today. And this has been very enlightening for me, and I'm sure it will give all of us reason to think ahead and prepare. So thanks so much for sharing this with us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is fun. I yes. like your style. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that.
You are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio. Now you can join us every Saturday morning on two Cleveland, Ohio stations or listen to us live online from anywhere in the world at the station's websites. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo. So happy to spend this hour with you to help you survive any healthcare or hospital encounter. Well, now today we opened the game chamber and everyone decided to play one of our most requested games, Are You in Jeopardy or Are You Safe? Here's how it goes. I will describe a healthcare or hospital associated scene and our contestants and you here in the studio will decide how you would react to that situation. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? What we're really asking here, is this a safe practice or not? So you're not going to get a whole lot of information. So don't give me the excuse that you don't have enough information. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Today, we have several guests right here in our studio, excited and ready to play and hopefully win the fabricated championship belt. Now entering the studio are today's contestants. And who do we have first? I'm Bob from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and I'm a former financial planner. Thank you and welcome, Bob. And second, we have... I'm Eric. I'm a regionally famous radio producer from Northeast Ohio. And welcome back to our regionally famous radio producer. And we have a special guest here in the studio. I'm Allison McMeachin, an attorney. These people will compete today on... Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? Let's get it on. All right. (laughs) Okay. Here is the first scenario. You are going to have some non-emergency elective surgery. You schedule your surgery for a Friday in July. Are you in jeopardy? Or are you safe? You want me to take it first? I think you're in jeopardy because July is a bad month to have any surgery. All right. Uh, because of uh, people on vacations, change, and then Friday's not a, ba- a bad day because everybody's in a hurry to get away. All right. That's what Bob thinks. What do you think, Eric? Honestly, I, I um, don't know. I never um, thought about that before. Well, I'm glad that you said that you never thought about that before because I think most people haven't thought about that before. Allison, what is your thought on that? I'm going to say that because I'm an optimist, I'm safe uh, because I'm putting all of the trust in my medical professional to (laughs) want to work late on a Friday (laughs) and not be planning his or her Hilton Head vacation to go golf. Thinking about going to play golf that (laughs) afternoon too. No, sorry. You're gonna get a beep, Allison. (laughs) Uh, Oh my gosh! And I'm glad what Eric said. What he said because I think many people don't think about this actually. Just given that bit of information, you could be in jeopardy because the summer months, holidays, weekends, and evenings are the most susceptible times for a medical error. Why? Because during the summer, many of the senior staff do take vacations, like Bob said. The new residents and interns begin their practice. The older and the more seasoned residents have graduated. So there's a real dramatic shift in personnel in July, and actually it's called the July effect, and it's especially known in teaching hospitals. And holidays, weekends, and nights are usually shifts that are given to those that are fairly new, those with less tenure. So if you have a choice, be smart and keep this information in mind. I think we all learned something here. I I definitely did. I was halfway right. (laughs) I'm scheduling all procedures for August on a Wednesday. There you go. Or October on a Wednesday, more even better. That's even better. (laughs) Excellent. All right, guys, here's scenario number two. You are a patient in the hospital. The alarm on your IV medication bag begins to beep. A guest in the room fiddles with it to turn it off. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? I am in jeopardy. (laughs) And I will be hitting my nurse call button repeatedly until someone comes to be sure that it's changed correctly. I think you're right. What do you think, Eric? I'm in jeopardy. I'm wondering, is this uh, other guest uh, trying to kill me? (laughs) That's right. You need to question who because that. of your snoring in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Definite jeopardy. Absolutely. So that's kind of an obvious one, right? Sorry. Of course, it's not the smart thing to do. Although I do admit that sometimes all of those alarms beeping do give you what's called alarm fatigue, and it probably gives the nurses alarm fatigue as well. But it's always best to alert the nurse in charge when the alarm goes off. When I was in the hospital with my mom, they came to know who I was and trusted me. And so they showed me how to turn that alarm off so it wouldn't wake up my mom. But then they knew that I was not going to just fall asleep and let it go, that I would call the nurse in charge. So, yeah, I think it's obviously an unsafe practice. 
It means something when it goes off. All right, here's scenario number three. You are having difficulty reading small print. You haven't had your eyes checked in years. A friend recommends her ophthalmologist. Before you schedule an appointment, you do some research online and specifically check to see if this doctor is board certified by checking the American Board of Ophthalmology website. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? In other words, is that a good practice? Unless this is a trick question somehow, that uh, sounds like you're safe. Okay. I think you're safe because I think no matter what type of procedure, no matter if it's eyes, nose, throat, whatever it is, you want to check to make sure that person is board certified in any practice. Okay. Allison? I agree you're safe. I think it's a good practice to look into anyone that's going to be providing treatment to you in any any type of medical field. I think it's an excellent idea. Now, when you get there, the doctor might not be so whoopee, so you might be in jeopardy then. But yeah, I'd suggest that no matter what type of doctor you plan to see, make sure he or she is board certified in the specific field of your concern. Take plastic surgery, for an example. We had a plastic surgeon on from Beverly Hills last year, and he very specifically said that some doctors, such as board board certified internist practice plastic surgery and say that they are board certified, which is in part is true, but they are not board certified in plastic surgery. They're board certified in something else and can get away with it. So yeah, do your homework, go to those state websites and find out. Didn't, for, didn't he also say that some dentists yes. say that they're uh, board certified plastic surgeons? They're board certified in dentistry. And so if you, they say, yes, we are board certified, but they're not specifically saying in plastic surgery. surgery. So yeah, be, be mindful and check and, and do your homework. Mm-hmm. All right, good, good guys. Here's scenario number four. You are a patient in the hospital. Every time a staff member enters the room, they ask your name. This is just irritating. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? Personally, I'd want to give them my name to make sure they got the right patient. I agree. I think it's important. I think you're safe. I think that the more information they get to you to be sure that they are, in fact, treating the right person, the better. Um, when we had my daughter, they came in and not only asked our name, but looked at our ID bracelets every time to be sure that, in fact, she was my child and I was her mother and we were all on the right. same page. So I think the more information they have to be sure they are carrying out the correct treatment is, is appropriate. Is appropriate. What do you think, Eric? Definitely annoyed, but safe. <laughs> it is annoying to say, yes, it's That's me. That's a good answer, Eric. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as irritating as it may be, it is an important precaution to make sure that you are who the staff thinks that you are. Make a huge sign and post it above your bed. Yes, I am Mrs. Delia Dinglemeyer, and please wash your hands before touching me. <laughs> Unless your name is not Mrs. Delia Dinglemeyer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, here's our last question. Scenario number five. You are taken to the hospital in an emergency. The healthcare providers ask if you have a living will or a healthcare power of attorney. You prepared these documents years ago and have no idea where they are. Your healthcare power of attorney has passed away last year. You shrug and pass out. Are you in jeopardy or are you safe? We're going to let Allison begin with that since it's your field of <laughs> Well, I think you are in jeopardy for not updating your planning subsequent to your agent passing away. And I think if you have these documents in place, it's very important that you know where they are and that other people have copies of them so that you're able to say, yes, I do have a health care power of attorney and this person is my agent. You can, however, now when you're renewing your license, when they ask if you are going to be an organ donor, they also ask you if you have a living will. So it's important that if you have that information, you disclose it to the VMV, then they put a nice little uh, sticker on the bottom of your license so that emergency personnel would know that in fact you do have a, a living will in place. Excellent information. Glad you're here. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, any uh, important papers like that, no matter what uh, they're pertaining to, you want to know exactly where they are and keep them in a safe place. So, um, yeah, if you don't have them uh, at that point, you are in jeopardy. (laughs) Yes, you are. And what do you say, Bob? I think they need to purchase your patient safety log and keep all their papers in the safety log with all your medical information. You were writing notes on napkins, toilet paper, and everything else when you came home. And trying to compile it. So if you don't have a patient safety log, we do have them. That's true. And that's a great place to keep it. Well, you guys have good answers. I'd say to all of you listeners out there, though, if you haven't prepared any of these types of documents, uh, you don't want to land in the hospital, shrug and pass out without 
updated advanced directives. You do not want to be in jeopardy. Well, guys, I'm not really sure who won that. <laughs> we all did. I, that's right. I think, <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a draw. That's right. <laughs> I feel like winners. I won because um, now I know about the July effect. <gasps> That's wow, that, that is good. Good. Yes. See, our, we're all winners and all of our listeners are winners too because now we all know a little bit more about patient safety. Well, thank you, Bob, for being with us You're today. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. And Allison, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Don't go anywhere. There's so much more that you can learn about healthcare and hospital safety on America's favorite and perhaps the only patient safety show in the world. Speak up and stay alive. Radio. And Bob, it's a wrap. Thank you. <laughs> With the holidays coming up, you just might find yourself traveling. If you've ever stayed in a hotel and wiped down the TV remote control before using it, you are not alone. An average hotel remote control is eight times more contaminated than a public toilet seat. So what are hotels doing about this? Hopefully everything they can, but it's not an easy problem to solve. A hygiene company from Texas called Cleanant has a device that cleans your remote for you using ultraviolet waves. The housekeeper puts the remote in the device after they clean the room, and by the time you check in, your remote is free from 99.94% of germs. Whether you suffer from sensitivities or simply take your hygiene seriously when you travel, you might want to call your hotel or motel of choice ahead of time and ask what they do to disinfect your room. If they offer no acceptable answer, suggest to them they look into Cleanant. Just visit Cleanant.com. That's C L E A N I N T. Dot com or call 888-715-0464. That's 888-715-0464. You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio, and I am Pat Rulo, author of the book of the same name, Speak Up and Stay Alive, The Patient Advocate Hospital Survival Guide, The Perfect Gift, for everyone on your I care about you list, no worry about duplicates or wrong size. This holiday season, you'll be a cool gift giver. You can order online at speakupandstayalive.com or you can call 440-725-5462. Get some of that holiday shopping done early. Purchase the book, the patient safety logs, the CD, or the very neat container of 10 plastic TV remote control covers. Give a gift that says, I care. Go to speakupandstayalive.com or call 440-725-5462. And while you're on the internet ordering some of our special gift items, type in speakuptalkradio.com, speakuptalkradio.com to listen to some fresh talk radio shows that we've added to our new internet station called Speak Up Talk Radio Network. There you will find some really innovative programming, such as Flavor Living Radio, where food and lifestyle merge together. We have Health Talk, today's hottest health topics from a complimentary perspective from Dr. Len Bransowitz. We've got Living in the Psychic Realm and Psychics Gone Wild, live psychic readings from an exceptionally accurate reader with a sense of humor. Realty Universal Radio, a show about real estate, but also about empowering people and giving back and living and laughing and loving. We've got the gift of choice. This inspirational hour provides information and motivation to help you live your dream and attain the health and happiness and abundance that you deserve. Then we have the vaccine agenda from a vaccine rights attorney talking about vaccine exemptions and waivers throughout the United States. That's very interesting. And then for fun, we have those weekend golf guys the voice of the average golfer. One of the hosts is a card-carrying PGA instructor. We've got Boil the Frog Slowly with my friend Sebastian answers the questions, are politics hazardous to your health? So there's more than that, but just to give you a little taste, be sure to go to speakuptalkradio.com. You can listen all day. And finally, before we part today, I want to quickly go back to my opening hazard and ask that you begin to take some baby steps to preserve your health, 
in order to stay out of a hospital in the future. Remember the horrible, irritating, jagged sounds of the cell phone radiation I played for you? Well, give your body a rest. Make a deal with yourself or with family members that cell phones get turned off at 5 o'clock or 7 o'clock. Pick a time well in advance of going to bed. Or no cell phones on Sunday. No cell phones in the bedroom. In fact, for a restful and restorative night's sleep, get everything electric and wireless out of your bedroom. I can't tell you how many people I'm meeting lately that complain that they cannot sleep. Not only is this annoying, but lack of sleep and poor sleep can cause health problems. Make your bedroom a safe zone. Cut off the wireless in the house at bedtime. Just turn it off. No cell phones, no cell chargers, no computers, routers, cordless telephones, or their base stations, or electric blankets. None of that should be in your bedroom. These disruptive microwave frequencies disturb the body's ability to produce melatonin, so necessary for a successful night's sleep and for your health. So try it and let me know how it goes. And then be sure to come back next week for who knows what will cross my path that I'll just have to share with you. Same time, same place, but you know me, never the same information. Until then, I hope you have a healthy and a happy week, free from utility company Big Brother and screeching cell phone radiation. I am Pat Rulo, and I am your guide to safe and successful healthcare and hospital encounters. Listen to Pat Rulo and Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. Stay safe from little known healthcare and hospital hazards. To learn more, go to speakupandstayalive.com. That's speakupandstayalive.com.